In this video, we're going to be discussing two philosophers you've likely heard of and one that you probably haven't heard of. So we're going to be discussing Hegel, Karl Popper and Walter Kaufmann. And these philosophers are related by a question raised by Karl Popper about the relationship between Hegel and totalitarianism. Popper was of the view that Hegel's philosophy directly contributed to the rise of totalitarianism in uh, mid-century Europe and um, Kaufman emphatically rejects this view and interestingly both Popper and Kaufman are Holocaust survivors and they have radically different views on this question um, and we're going to be using a few texts to to elucidate this. We're going to be using uh, the primary texts which are Hegel's philosophy of right and the phenomenology of spirit. We're going to be using Popper's The Open Society and Its Enemies, specifically volume two, although we will discuss volume one as well. And we're going to be using a book by Walter Kaufman, which is Hegel, A Reinterpretation. And we're also going to be using an essay that Kaufman wrote, which was a direct response to Karl Popper. Um, to structure this video, we're going to be first talking about who Hegel was. I'm going to be giving a brief rundown of Hegel and his philosophy, um, particularly his political philosophy, but also a background on the phenomenology of spirit. We're going to be talking about who Walter Kaufman was as well, um, which will probably be a new person for most people watching this video. And then we're going to be talking about Karl Popper and his interpretation of Hegel. Then we're going to get into a critique of Popper's interpretation of Hegel. Um, and then I'm going to give you Kaufman's critique as well. Um, and finally, we're going to get into Kaufman's interpretation of Hegel, which is a really interesting and rich interpretation of Hegel, which um, is probably going to contain a lot of new information for uh, English speakers and the Anglosphere audience. So, who is Hegel? Well, many people have heard of Hegel, but his philosophy is notoriously arcane and difficult to interpret. So, Hegel's a 19th century uh, philosopher, almost all of his work was um, done in the early and mid 19th century. And he's known for three works primarily. Uh, the Philosophy of Right, which is a book on political philosophy. Uh, the Phenomenology of Spirit, which is his most significant work, and this is on metaphysics. And The Science of Logic. Um, so he really reaches out across all of the main branches of philosophy and treats them um, with varying degrees of success. And he was a philosopher who was deeply embedded in history. Um, so he saw the French Revolution as a 19 year old. Um, <clears throat> he uh, was teaching at the University of Yana. He, he finished the Phenomenology of Spirit as Napoleon was marching through Yana. And this is where you get the famous quote about Napoleon as world history um, embodied on horseback. Um, and he's best known for his dialectic. So um, the dialectic is the movement of spirit through history, um, through a, a continual process of um, one form of the idea of freedom or spirit or geist um, embodying the um, inadequacies in previous aspects. So this is a very abstract, abstract concept and we'll make it more concrete in the treatment of the master-slave dialectic, which, will, um, which is central to Popper's critique of Hegel. But um, it's best to understand Hegel's view of metaphysics, which is that there is a, a progression of geist, which translates to spirit, or mind, um, embodied in history. So Geist is moving, is the actor, the reason why history happens. And it's going from a basic understanding of itself. So this is universal consciousness. And it's got a basic understanding of itself initially, which is called sense certainty. And it progresses through a dialectical process to absolute knowledge, which is the culmination of world history and the culmination of freedom and of Geist. Um, now, I've done the best job I can explaining that, and I don't have a perfect understanding of Hegel, um, but that should suffice as, an, as a definition of the dialectic for the purposes of this video, because if you understood that, you have a better understanding than Karl Popper, in my opinion. So, who was Walter Kaufman? Well, Walter Kaufman was certainly a philosopher in his own right. He felt perfectly justified in coming out with his interpretation of Hegel, um, and as you can see by the reviews on the back cover, uh, this was very well received. Um, there are positive reviews from Sidney Hook, 
um, one of the most significant figures in American philosophy, um, particularly pragmatism, um, from Ernest Nagel, from Isaiah Berlin. This is really the who's who of 20th century philosophy, and they have outstanding reviews for this book. Um, but Calvin was much more than a, a philosopher. In fact, he was best known as a translator, and particularly a translator of German poetry, and specifically of Nietzsche, and not just the poetry of Nietzsche. Uh, remember that Nietzsche was a fantastic poet in his own right, as well as a obviously world-changing philosopher. But um, he was a translator of the works of Nietzsche and also of poetry. Yeah. So the, where I came across Walter Kaufman was in this book, uh, 25 German Poets. And there's sections in this book on Goethe, on Holderlin, on uh, Heinrich Heine, um, Rilke, um, really the who's who of German poetry. And uh, Kaufman translated them and he's renowned as a translator of German poetry. Um, and that's enormously significant for this video because Kaufman really draws heavily on Hegel's connection to German poetry. And this is a connection that English speakers really struggle to make, which is the significance of um, the German um, 19th century understanding of their connection to Greek civilization. And this connection was facilitated through poetry, uh, particularly the poetry of Holderlin. And um, Hegel was best friends with Holderlin. And Faust as well was a very significant figure who was influenced by um, Greek, Greek tragedies particularly. And uh, Hegel channels Goethe as well. So um, Kaufman does a fantastic job in really laying out for the English speaking audience just how significant the connection to the Greeks are in the work of Hegel um, and also in the work of these, uh, these poets. So who was Karl Popper? Well, Popper was born in Vienna, but he certainly wasn't a continental philosopher like Hegel or Kant before him. Um, Popper was an empiricist, um, following in the footsteps of uh, someone like Bertrand Russell. Um, and Popper is best known for his contributions to the philosophy of science, particularly the doctrine of falsifiability, which forms the basis of the way that modern science operates. Falsifiability is the idea that scientific progress um, occurs through falsifying claims made by other scientists. So a scientist will come out with a, a claim about the way the world works, and this claim has the property that it can be in principle falsified. You can subject it to a test and you can determine whether or not this claim um, conforms with reality based on whether it's falsifiable. Now, this doesn't mean that if a claim hasn't been falsified, that it is true. In fact, this is one of the central aspects of falsifiability and something that Popper views as important in science, which is that no claim can ever be on a 100% concrete foundation. It can always in principle be falsified. And this has implications for his political philosophy as well. So if science is the, uh, the peak of the human, um, of human knowledge, is the, is the main way which humans advance themselves, which is true in Popper's view, and science itself doesn't rest on concrete foundations. How can something like politics rely on concrete foundations? So Popper says that, you know, politics could, should not um, make concrete claims that are universally true. Um, it should be, it should, there should be an aspect of humility to politics and people should operate in political systems with an understanding that they may hold, hold beliefs about metaphysics, about religion, but those are personal beliefs. And that's the essence of an open society for Popper is a society that allows people the scope to hold their own views on questions of religion and metaphysics, but doesn't enforce any metaphysical claims because those metaphysical claims can't really have a strong basis. And this is very anti-Hegelian. Um, although Popper's interpretation of Hegel, I think, is extremely flawed. And I think the best way to understand Popper's interpretation is through one particular quote. And this quote surrounds Hegel's famous master-slave dialectic. Um, Pop, quoting from the Open Society and its foundations, Popper says that Hegel points out that all personal relations can thus be reduced to the fundamental relation of master and slave, of domination and submission. Um, each must strive to assert and prove himself, and he who has not the nature, the courage, and the general capacity for preserving this, his independence, 
must be reduced to servitude. This charming theory of personal relations has, of course, its counterpart in Hegel's theory of international relations. Nations must assert themselves on the stage of history. It is their duty to attempt the domination of the world. So this is a very flawed interpretation of Hegel's master-slave dialectic, and it's flawed for three reasons. The first being um, the reduction that Popper performs by saying that human relations are reduced to that of master and slave. The second is the decontextualization of the master-slave dialectic in the broader project of the phenomenology of spirit. And third is the application of the master-slave dialectic to Hegel's political philosophy. So let's go back to the reduction question. Um, the whole point of the master-slave dialectic is not that there are, there's a dichotomy between human beings in terms of there are masters and there are slaves. Um, even at the point in history that Hegel's talking about in the master-slave dialectic, it's actually that there is a concept of freedom, the idea of freedom, is embedded in the servitude of the slave. Um, and that's why the master-slave dialectic gives way to Stoicism. And Stoicism is a form of freedom. In fact, um, Stoicism emerged from slaves um, in, uh, in ancient Rome. So that's the, the first flaw in Popper's interpretation, which is that he's oversimplifying the dialectic and he's not recognizing the idea of dialectical progression from servitude to freedom. And th that's the sort of cutting of reason, um, to use a Hegelian term, in the master-slave dialectic, which is that even a very straightforward relation, one that seems like it's just about master and just about slave, well, there's a reversal that takes place in the master-slave dialectic itself, and the master actually becomes bound to the slave because he needs both the recognition of the slave, which is the whole basis of the master-slave uh, clash, which is the need for recognition and to subordinate the other um, in a subject-object relation. But it's also the fact that the slave is the one who produces artifice. And by producing artifice, the slave is embodying, is creating freedom. It's, he's creating things in the world that last forever. And that, that's a form of freedom. So this is a really, really flawed and quite frankly, it's a Hobbesian interpretation of the master-slave dialectic. And that's something we're gonna come back to. The second aspect is the decontextualization. And I already touched on this by the fact that yes, even if we take Popper's simplified view of the master-slave dialectic, this was only true of human beings at a particular point in the history of Geist going from sense certainty to absolute knowledge. And so, yes, maybe let's just assume that Popper's right about the simplicity of the master-slave dialectic. Well, that isn't an eternal truth of human beings. It was a truth at one particular point in time. And the fact that Popper just takes this one aspect of the development of spirit from the phenomenology of spirit and says that that characterizes human beings for eternity means that he misunderstands the entire project of the phenomenology of spirit, which is about dialectical progression. And the third aspect is Popper's application of the master-slave dialectic to political philosophy. Now, um, Hegel wrote a book on political philosophy called The Philosophy of Right. And in this book, Hegel talks very little about the interaction between states with each other. It's primarily about the ethical basis of the state itself. Uh, the final few sections, um, really sections 300 onwards to the end of the book, talk about the concept of, concept of uh, you know, sovereignty, uh, war, international law, etc. Um, there's not a comprehensive analysis of um, of the way that states relate to each other. Uh, that's something that, that was addressed by later thinkers. Again, we're gonna get back to this. Um, I think that Popper is really reading other philosophers into Hegel because Hegel was primarily concerned with the ethical basis of the state. Now, Hegel's no pacifist. Um, that's pretty clear in the philosophy of right. Um, he, he believes that there are ethical conditions that make war justifiable and that citizens have a duty to the state. But it's really pretty straight. And this is the thing that people forget about Hegel is that it's pretty common sense, almost conservative wisdom that comes out of the philosophy of right about how um, citizens should act in relation to warfare and their obligations to the state. Well, if Popper's reading Hobbes into Hegel in terms of the master-slave dialectic, then 
Popper is reading Carl Schmitt into Hegel in terms of um, Hegel's political philosophy. So why does Hegel act as a foil for Hobbes and Carl Schmitt in, uh, in the, the eyes of Popper? And this is for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, Hobbes is a mechanical thinker. For anyone who's read Hobbes' Leviathan, you'll know that the first half of the book is dedicated to laying out a conception of human beings as essentially clockwork. Um, and this is something that is highly scientific. So there's a scientific dimension to Hobbes' project in the Leviathan. And that's something which would not square very well with, um, with Popper's project of trying to move towards a rational, uh, scientifically ordered society because um, Hobbes' view on the nature of human beings is based on a scientific understanding, or at least from his perspective, from Hobbes' perspective, a scientific understanding of human beings. And Hobbes was um, before his time in terms of a, applying a Newtonian approach to uh, human beings. He really views you know, human beings atomically um, and he views them mechanically as well. So there's an individualism to Hobbes and also a, a mechanistic frame of mind to Hobbes that actually conforms a lot better to liberalism, but Popper really takes issue with the idea of like a, an anarchic um, war of all against all state of nature. And instead of attacking Hobbes for that, he attacks Hegel because Hegel's conclusions are collectivist as opposed to Hobbes's conclusions, which are maybe more compatible with liberalism. Um, so why then doesn't Popper critique Carl Schmitt in direct terms? Um, firstly, it's because Schmitt is less well-known than Hegel, and Schmitt was clearly straightforward and a member of the Nazi party. So there's no real need to critique the philosophy of Schmitt um, in direct terms. I think that, that Popper wanted to attack the antecedents of Schmitt, and he saw Hegel as an antecedent of Schmitt. And to be fair, um, Schmitt was influenced by Hegel, but Schmitt was more influenced by Hobbes. And Schmidt was probably also more influenced by Kierkegaard. Um, there's definitely a strong um, existential dimension to Schmidt's political philosophy, particularly in the early political philosophy, the political philosophy of political theology. Um, but the, um, the famous friend-enemy distinction, which characterizes the relationship between states and the, the essence of the political in Schmidt, um, that doesn't come from Hegel directly. That is a Hobbesian idea. So why does um, why does Popper need to treat Hegel at all? And it's fundamentally because Popper's trying to construct this conceptual bridge between antiquity and modernity. And uh, the main project of the Open Society and its enemies is a critique of Plato. And Popper really wants to say that Plato is the fundamental root cause of totalitarianism, even in modernity. And so how does Plato affect modernity. How, what is the relationship between Plato and Nazi Germany? Well, um, this effect is caused by a conceptual bridge and the conceptual bridge in Popper's mind is between the pylons of Aristotle and Hegel. So Hegel brings Aristotle into modernity and um, Aristotle channels Plato and the, uh, the totalitarian ideas that to be fair were in um, Plato's Republic. So ideas of the myth of the metals, of the noble eye, um, and of uh, taking children from their parents and raising them communally. There, there's totalitarian aspects to Plato, to be fair. But um, to in order to bring that into modernity, you need the figures of Aristotle and Hegel. And Popper links these two figures through teleology. So anyone who's studied Aristotle knows that uh, a central word in Aristotle's philosophy and Aristotle's like, political philosophy um, is teleology. So things are directed towards ends. And that's the basis of say virtue ethics, for example. And Hegel is also uh, a teleological thinker. I mean, you just need to think about the phenomenology of spirit in terms of the end of a, a blooming flower being contained in the seed. Um, that's a teleological frame of thought. Um, however, this connection is very abstract and you could also draw a connection between Hegel and the um, process 
philosophers that preceded Socrates. So thinking Heraclitus and Parmenides who um, thought of the world as in flux and as one. And um, these were fundamentally monist thinkers. I think that the, the connection between the process philosophers, early process philosophers um, and Hegel is probably stronger. So um, re really Popper demonstrates a poor understanding of Hegel in this quote um, in terms of he has a very abstract idea of the connection between a Hegel and Aristotle. And he also misreads Hegel and he reads other philosophers into Hegel where he should be treating those philosophers directly. He should be treating Hobbes directly um, and he should be treating Carl Schmitt directly. So if those are my critiques of Karl Popper, what are Kaufman's critiques of Popper? And I think the first aspect to um, Kaufman's critique is the fact that he doesn't think Popper was acting in good faith. And he accuses Popper of being absolutely hysterical. And I think that Kaufman has a point with his criticism of Popper. Um, having said that, the primary critiques of Popper in Kaufman's essay were technical and practical. Um, so what were the technical critiques that Kaufman leveled against Popper? The first was uh, mistranslation. And this is something that is common with Hegel because the translation from German into English is difficult with any author, but particularly with Hegel's very idiosyncratic style. He had these long compound sentences that rely on gender to uh, to know who you're talking about in, in these sentences. And so when you translate Hegel, uh, the translator needs to deconstruct these sentences and reformulate them. And um, <clears throat> things can get lost in translation often with Hegel. Um, Popper is particularly bad with some of his use, usages of um, tenuous translations. So the most famous example of this is um, Hegel's quote that the state is the march of God through history. Um, that is a, a questionable quotation and that also comes from a student who is recording Hegel's lectures. Um, the second technical critique that Kaufman levels against Popper is his use of quilt quotations. So um, this is a controversial practice in academic philosophy and academic, academia more generally and it's a practice of taking sentence fragments and pairing them with other sentence fragments separated by ellipses. Now, this can really be used to um, manipulate the work of a particular author. And this is something which Hegel's already ripe for misinterpretation because of the dialectic. He's making claims that are true at various points in history. And so you can always take Hegel out of context. And the use of quilt quotations makes it even easier to take Hegel out of context, which is something that Popper does liberally. So those are the two technical uh, critiques that Kaufman levels of Popper. What are the practical critiques? Well, the first is the question of intentionality. And was Hegel a, a good actor? Um, Kaufman answers this by pointing out that Hegel was no racist, no anti-Semite. In fact, some of Hegel's liberal peers were far more anti-Semitic than Hegel was himself. Hegel called for the emancipation of Jews in um, the Prussian state. Um, also, the, there's the question, the perennial question, of whether Hegel was acting um, simply as a propagandist for the Prussian state with the philosophy of history. This is something that a lot of um, philosophers of students of Hegel level as a charge against Hegel. Um, Kaufman dismisses this, although there is some basis for um, claiming that Hegel was acting um, at the behest of the, Russian, of the Prussian state. Um, and secondly, what were the effects of Hegel? Did the Nazis actually read Hegel? And um, while it is true that um, people like Giovanni Gentile were neo-Hegelians, um, that was more a consequence of them coming out of Marxism. So yes, there were Hegelian uh, fascists, but in Nazi Germany, students didn't generally read Hegel and Nazi party members were generally more fond of philosophers like Nietzsche, uh, philosophers like Schopenhauer, and yes, Plato, than they were of Hegel. Um, Hegel was rarely read by German school children. So um, these are the critiques that Kaufman levels against Popper's interpretation of Hegel. And I think that very little of Popper's interpretation of Hegel stands as a valid critique of, of uh, the totalitarian tendencies of Hegel. So what was Walter Kaufman's interpretation of Hegel? Um, well, the first aspect of Kaufman's interpretation that really made me raise my eyebrows was his perspective on Hegel's Christianity. So according to Kaufman, um, Hegel was um, hypercritical of Christianity, particularly in his early writings. Um, 
And according to Kaufman, that critique of Christianity never really went away in Hegel's work. It um, only tempered. And this is something that I'm, I'm skeptical of. Um, if there's any part of the book that I question, it would be um, Kaufman's perspective on Hegel's Christianity. I think that, that was probably lensed by Kaufman's uh, Nietzscheanism and also Kaufman's rejection of uh, Lutheranism in his youth. So um, I would take Kaufman's interpretation of the Christianity of Hegel with a grain of salt, but it's interesting to discuss nonetheless. So in the view of Kaufman, Hegel went beyond Nietzsche in his critique of Christ. Um, Nietzsche was critical of the Christian project and the application of um, Christianity to, um, to politics. But there was a certain reverence to the figure of Christ that still existed in Nietzsche beyond the, um, the Nietzsche's critique of slave morality, um, which probably came out of the Sermon of the Mount. Um, according to Kaufman, Hegel was far more critical of Christ himself and actually favoured the figure of Socrates. Um, in fact, Kaufman talks about how um, Hegel, in one of his works, compared the, um, <clears throat> the, the drinking of the blood of Christ in the Eucharist to um, contracting a venereal disease or, or hoping, or people in the mass hoping that they didn't contract a venereal disease from, um, from drinking the blood of Christ. So that's obviously quite a sacrilegious statement for Hegel to make. And I don't fully know the context of that quote, but I would imagine that there's an element of irony or um, a youthful rebellious dimension to what Hegel was saying there. So um, that's an interesting aside, but the most valuable part of Kaufman's interpretation of Hegel really comes from uh, the connection to um, German poetry and the connection to ancient Greece. And this is something that Kaufman is uniquely placed to value because he's got this perspective as a translator of um, of German poetry and German poetry at the time was deeply influenced by the connection to the Greeks. So there is a strong emphasis on the connection between um, between Goethe and, um, and Hegel. So uh, this is not just the Iphigenia, but also Faust. And there's a, a chapter in the book about um, interpretations of, um, of Faust in uh, the phenomenology of spirit in particular, um, including uh, Josiah Royce's interpretation of Faust in the phenomenology. There's also, as we might um, expect, a strong focus on Hodelin. So Hodelin was the best friend of uh, Hegel and in fact, um, a fantastic poet, uh, probably the, the premier German poet after Goethe. And he also translated a play um, called Antigone, so um, from Sophocles. Um, so he was the, the German translator of that play. And that, uh, as well as the Hyperion, which he's better known for. And the Antigone has, the central theme of the Antigone is um, a question of ethics. It's a question of um, the ethical duties of a sister to her brother and um, a clash between obligations one has to their family, to the gods, um, to... <coughs> To civil society and this is a question that, that Hegel seeks to answer in the philosophy of right. It's about cyclicite, about ethical life and so there's no understating the effect of Holderlin on the um, on the work of Hegel and um, I think the Kaufman does a better job than anyone at really elucidating this connection. And the final aspect is the direct comparison between the Greeks, the Greek, uh, Greek Socratic philosophers and Kant through Hegel. Now, this is a connection that Popper makes ham-fistedly, but Kaufman makes in a, in a much more nuanced and I think um, interesting way. So uh, Kant really was a cyclone that sort of ravaged the European intellectual landscape in the same way that Socrates was. Socrates was the gadfly and he really dismantled a lot of the conventional thinking um, in ancient Greece and really created the intellect, as Kaufman puts it, created the intellectual tradition that um, that formed what we know of as like antiquity, the uh, philosophy of antiquity. And Hegel uh, was more of an Aristotelian figure. And what does um, Kaufman mean by that? Well, these are real constructors of systems. So whereas Kant had this destructive effect, in fact, um, a 
German poet, uh, Heinrich Heine, really talks about the destructive effects of Immanuel Kant in relation to Robespierre, who's another sort of maybe Socratic figure, um, someone who really came in with a jackhammer and dismantled um, priors that a lot of the ancient Greeks had. Um, Hegel is the opposite of that. Hegel is a grand system builder. Aristotle is also a grand system builder. These are people who um, created these frameworks that, um, yeah, they're, they're flawed frameworks. Like people generally um, reject most of Aristotelian like metaphysics and, um, but he's, he left a lot of contributions to biology, etc. cetera. Um, and Hegel really came in and created this grand system. Um, he also draws this interesting connection between, uh, between the philosophy of Hegel and Aristotle and the connection to warfare. Um, so obviously Aristotle was the tutor of Alexander the Great um, and watching Alexander the Great and tutoring him obviously had a significant impact on Aristotle himself. There's also the connection between Hegel and Napoleon and the Prussian state as well. So these are, are philosophers who are deeply connected to questions of the state and also warfare expansion an empire in a way that Kant and Socrates weren't really. Now, now Socrates became connected to the state when he was executed, but before that he was a more, much more abstract philosopher, whereas Hegel and Aristotle are more, much more deeply connected to the machinations of the state and to the act of warfare.